Hi everybody, Andy from Tracy Seismograph here. I thought I'd take a little time today to explain the display and give a little idea of what it is that you're looking at and what it is that you're hearing when you're watching the live stream. So let's start with a normal day. Right now I am basically recording the live stream as it's going on as I'm recording this video. It's a relatively average business day, Monday through Friday. There's traffic on the road behind the house. You can see that traffic in this video display. That's the reason why I have this camera here. So you can see the cars and the trucks as they go by. Uh, this road's about 80 feet away from the sensor. So we do see those cars and trucks. This is the street in front of the house again so that we can watch for cars and trucks going by and maybe things shaking. You know, I do have a, a camera stand out here by the mailbox. If we have heavy waves, we may see that move. There's a street light across the street over here. Heavy waves, we may see that move as well. So that's the other reason for my having the video cameras of recording what exactly is going on as, as things move. Back to the display. If we go to the upper right-hand corner, up here you can see this moving graph of the wiggles. This is the up and down motion that the seismograph is measuring. On a normal day, we're going to see this average a preliminary magnitude 4.5 earthquake at a depth of 618 kilometers has occurred, located south of the Fiji Islands, which is 5,659 miles southwest of Tracy, California, was recorded by the USGS at 19 hours 50 minutes and 45 seconds UTC. And we get interrupted by quake speak, which I'm going to explain in a few minutes as well. Back to our graph. So up here we see this moving graph all the wiggles, the vertical motion that my seismograph is sensing. And you can see it auto scales. And right now the scale is running about plus 50 micrometers to minus 50 micrometers. During the day, you'll see this hit 100, 200, maybe 300 micrometers as big heavy trucks go by or something like that. Uh, to give you an idea, a micrometer, 100 micrometers is about the thickness of a human hair. So that's how sensitive the seismograph is. If 100 micrometers is the thickness of a human hair, these small movements that are down at 10 or 20 micrometers are very, very tiny vibrations in the earth that the sensor is picking up. So that's one of the things to keep in mind. This does auto scale. So the bigger these wiggles get, the bigger the waves get, the scale will change so that it becomes less sensitive. And then after a period of time when like this big wiggle works its way off the screen, you'll see this scale change and it will get more sensitive again. So now you can see the scale went down to 20 micrometers per second of motion. So it auto scaled, got much more sensitive. Obviously when a big wave comes in, it's going to auto scale and it's going to become much less sensitive. So you see just the big waves and not the smaller waves. The timestamps are down here along the bottom. They move along with the data, so you can tell that this particular wiggle happened about this particular time. Moving down to the next part of the display, this is the spectrogram. So this is a visual representation of the frequency the, and the amplitude of the shaking that the seismograph measures over time. Time would be the horizontal, so this is the earliest and this is the latest as things move across the screen to the left. Uh, the timestamps again up here also work for this portion of the display. On the vertical axis, this is frequency. So at this point, this would be 20 hertz, or in other words, the sensor moved up and down 20 times per second. This would be 40 hertz. The sensor moved up and down 40 times per second. The intensity of that movement is indicated by how bright the colors are on the screen. The dark blue back here, that's relatively no motion. The bright yellow patches, that's where the motion becomes more intense. So intensity is the color, frequency is the up and down, and time is the left and right with the most current data coming in over here at the right side of the screen. During the day as traffic goes by, you're going to notice that right around 15, 17 hertz, somewhere between about here and say 30 hertz, you're going to see a band of a lot of activity. And that band of activity is all the traffic noise, and that's just not the cars moving along on the streets, but Tracy is surrounded by interstates, 
on three sides that are a mile or two away and we're actually seeing cars trucks vibrations being produced by that traffic as well on an almost continuous basis during the day at night this gets much quieter uh, and we see much less of this spatter that's going on in here and we see more of just the traffic noises particularly of the close by traffic so as cars and trucks go by you'll see a truck going by on the display over here in just a second and you'll notice on the spectrograph the yellow line begins and then we get a big poof of yellow there's your truck just went by in the display and you can tell that it was a truck because of this, the video display and then this is the signature of that truck going by. So that's sort of how my spectrogram works. So you can also see that it auto scaled and some of the background got much darker because this was a more intense movement. So this is another auto scaling. Now with this when an earthquake occurs, earthquakes mostly occur on my spectrogram. We see them between about 0 and 5 or 10 Hertz. So just below the line of the traffic to the bottom and you'll see a bright line down the bottom of this display and that bright line down the bottom of the display is a very good indication that what you're seeing is actually an earthquake this little dim stuff here this is again just normal urban noise traffic noise other things you may see in here is you may see little pops equally spaced and you may see little pops kind of like here and here and here and here that may be somebody walking close by say within two or three houses from where the seismograph is that may be kids playing basketball down the block every time they bounce the ball 500 yards away my seismograph picks that up and it displays it both up here in the wiggle and down here in the spectrograph moving down the display this is a another wiggle display but you'll notice most of the time this line is very flat and this line is very flat because this is a fixed scale line going from 150,000 plus to 150,000 minus if you see a wave that hits the top and the bottom of this that was a very strong wave approaching saturation of the seismograph and I can pretty much tell you if it hits the top and the bottom we here in Tracy felt that earthquake uh, if it's between, say, these middle or two lines, which is about plus 75,000 and minus 75,000, we might have felt it if you were sensitive to it, but most likely not, and it's just an indication that it was fairly large. If you see just a little tiny bump in here, it was a pretty small earthquake. Again, on this, your time scale is on the bottom. The most recent is going to come in from the right, and then it's going to move across to the left each of the lines going vertical on here the dotted lines going up and down those are indicating one hour as this is a four hour display total moving down this is the main display this is the very sensitive it's not scaled uh, there's an exception to that but for the most part it's not scaled and you can see that it's very sensitive so you can see little tiny wiggles going on through here something else to note about this display and this display is unlike the top display the top display is not filtered it shows all frequencies that get picked up no matter what these lower two displays are filtered and they will only show you wiggles that happen between 0.1 hertz and 3 hertz uh, in frequency that way we don't see all of this other noise we only see what we're really interested in hopefully which is earthquakes but some of the noise is still going to find its way through and it's going to be very small in these wiggles one way you can tell how sensitive i have it set is down here you can see a number so you see x5 that means that it's five minutes per line each of these dotted lines here is a five minute or a one minute period excuse me one minute period for these dotted lines so starting at 2020 that would be this minute 2021 is this minute 2022 is this minute etc so one minute per dotted line five minutes total per line this is my seismograph just kind of telling us the ID and then the colon and there's a number here this number is the gain that I have the seismograph set to 
the higher this number is when you see it, the less sensitive this display is. So if you see this at night, often I'll have it set to around 60. That makes it a bit more sensitive. During the day, I tend to run it at about 80. It helps eliminate some of the traffic noise and some of the false uh, averages that may happen. Average input, this is the average count of top to bottom of the wave as it comes in. Usually the counts are fairly small. You'll see when a truck goes by, that number is going to get larger. The minimum, maximum, and total count, this is the minimum that it saw, so the lowest negative number, the highest positive number, and then the total between those two numbers. So 2,298 was the biggest count between positive and negative peaks of the wave. Down at the bottom, we have two clocks. One's in UTC, Universally Coordinated Time. This is what the science world does time in. There's no time zones. Uh, it is the time at Greenwich, England. And so that we're all on the same sheet of music, so to speak, we use UTC for our time, for our data, so that it's easy to correlate data without having to worry about things like time zones. And the next time, you'll notice is PDT, which is Pacific Daylight Time, and that is our local California time here at the seismograph. Coming up here to the upper left-hand corner, this is the last eight events that USGS has recorded. So we plucked the data off the USGS feed. You'll notice that it is all events, no matter what their magnitude. So it could be a 0 0.1, even a 0, 0.0 if they decide to put that in there. And it's going to tell you some information of where it is. So six kilometers northwest of Geysers, California, for example, it was a 0 0.4 magnitude earthquake. It was 3.4 kilometers in depth where the epicenter was, and then the timestamp down below it, again in UTC. So if you're trying to look at that and correlate it to local time, you'll have to do that conversion from UTC to either Pacific Daylight Time or Pacific Standard Time, depending on where we are in the time cycle of the year. So this is the last eight events as published by the USGS. You will occasionally see you know, an event like this 4.5 may actually change before it washes off the display where USGS came in. And for that particular event, they changed the magnitude, they changed the depth, something like that. After a human scientist sat down and looked at the data uh, instead of just what the computer picked. And the computer does sometimes make false picks. Uh, we saw that with the big 6.0 across the valley here in July where the computer before the 6.0 posted had actually picked that there was a 4.2, I believe it was, outside of Stockton. That was a bad computer pick, and about 40 minutes after the event happened, a human seismologist reviewed all the data, and that event disappeared off of the feed. Down here towards the bottom, in the lower left, this map is indicating all of the earthquakes inside of the geographic area that we can see the map. Again, there's no bottom on this, so you'll see zero point somethings up to whatever the biggest one was. Uh, you can kind of get a relative indication looking at this map at how big the event was uh, based on the number of rings around that particular spot. And there is also a flag at the end of a little stick that tells us that this event was a magnitude 1.2 you'll see it's a little tiny dot. Over here, I see three rings. This was probably a magnitude three point something or two point something. And you can tell that it was a little bigger. You may come on here, I'll show you a big event later and you'll see those rings cover almost the entire map. You count the rings and you'll see that there's five or six or four rings outside. That's gonna give you again that visual indication of how big that event actually was. The other thing to note about this map is the colors. So this map holds 12 hours of events. So if it's a white ring like this, where it's almost all white, that's a very recent event. If it's pink, that's probably about six hours old. And if it's dark red like this one, that one's probably closer to 12 hours old. Once it hits 12 hours, this earthquake will actually disappear off the feed. Down here in the bottom, you'll have this last event. We have a couple different last event places. 
again this last event like this and reports earthquakes from all over the world so the last event anywhere in the world that USGS has reported is going to appear in this box. This gives you a little more information than the upper screen does because this one actually gives you the latitude and longitude so if you wanted to go plot it on your own you could record those values put it into Google Earth or Google Maps and it'll show you where that latitude and longitude was. You can see it just refreshed it did not change so our last event is still a 0.33 kilometers depth at this location and it happened at this time on this date. Up here in the top you'll see the same this one actually says 0.4 so they revised that 0.4 to a 0.3 and that's what's appearing here now so USGS plays games with the data uh, and the GeoJSON feeds that we pick it up from the USGS sometimes one application picks things up faster than the other. But we're basically showing you several different applications worth of data all at the same time. Give you a better situational awareness to, at a glance, either visually or reading or whatever. If we come back up to the top of the screen, you'll see another map up here. This map is actually all of the Raspberry Shake seismographs, all of the amateur seismographs that are in California and some into Nevada a little bit, but on the geographic area that's represented by my map. Up in the top here, you'll see a scale that goes from uh, whites and blues. They start getting a little more blue than yellow, then orange, then red, and then purple. So smaller shaking is up at the top with the blues. Heavier shaking is at the bottom with the deep purples and reds. So right now if we look around we can see there's some yellow seismographs. They're changing color between yellow and green. So this is probably normal average daily noise uh, as most of these are in more urban type environments. So same thing as mine as cars, trucks go by. Um, the level of shaking changes so you see them changing colors. What we're looking for for an earthquake is for groups of these to go deep reds or purples. When you see deep reds and purples start to gang up, say in the San Francisco Bay Area here, but the things over on the other side of the Sierras are still greens and yellows, that means we had an earthquake that epicentered somewhere near San Francisco Bay, and those seismographs are reporting back to the big computer in the cloud what the level of shaking they're seeing, and that big computer changes our display and starts changing these to oranges and reds and purples. When it's scattered like this, you can see there's red in there, there's orange in there, the orange just turned red, there's yellows, there's greens, there's blues, blues are light, yellows are mid, reds are high shaking, high-ish shaking, purples are the hard one. Again, that's because of traffic, urban noise, movements in a neighborhood, movements in people's homes, whatever. So when we're looking for an earthquake, we're looking for an entire geographic area to turn all one big bright color, bright reds, bright oranges, or bright purples in the heaviest case of shaking. The last thing that we have on our screen is what I call the shake meter. So most of you have watched this and you've kind of wondered why it doesn't seem to do anything except make numbers and uh, does the ring ever do anything? And the answer to that is yes. So this is this is a mean average deviation of the shaking the waves the top of the peaks to the bottom of the troughs over the period of a second and I take the mean average deviation of the counts as they come in and display it so you see it just went up a little bit as cars went by once that car gets down the road we're back into the 70s or 100s at night you'll see this drop into sometimes 10s 20s 30s 40s at night it's really quiet when all the traffic dies down so along with this count is the circle. And the circle, believe it or not, it does move. So if we get into a mean count where the shaking is approaching, say, the 10,000 mark, that may take this circle and, and fill it in, starts as greens, moves into yellows, moves into reds, and then moves into oranges and purples. When the circle completes with color, the whole circle will be purple. That means we're feeling motion here in Tracy. That's a very heavy motion indication from the seismograph. And this number will be in the hundreds of thousands instead of the hundreds. 
So that's what this indicates. Another thing is still a piece of experimental code I'm working on is the intensity scale at the top. Right now you'll notice it says intensity 1, not felt, supposedly between a magnitude 0 and a magnitude 3. That would be a local intensity. In other words, it's as if the earthquake happened a mile or two from my sensor. This is the intensity. I'm doing some math in my code. If it works like I hope it does, if it's a very strong earthquake, this will actually go from intensity 1 on the Mercalli intensity scale to intensity 2, intensity 3, intensity 4. Uh, at intensity 3, we'll start feeling things. At intensity 4, we'll start getting enough motion that there could be damage. Uh, and the text will also change color as the counts increase on this, as this uh, intensity scale goes up. Again, this is experimental code. No guarantees this actually works. We don't get many big earthquakes for me to uh, test my code with, so I have to wait for the next big earthquake to see whether it actually works like I think it's supposed to work and my math is correct. So that's pretty much the screen in a nutshell uh, of what you're seeing, what they sort of mean, what's going on, a uh, little explanation of like the sizes, so what's 100 micrometers or what's 50 micrometers. So again, remember 100 micrometers is about the thickness of a human hair. And that's the measurement of the movement that we're measuring. So if the big peak, like in this case, hits somewhere around 100 micro, micrometers, you can see that peak right there. That meant that my sensor moved about the thickness of a human hair. It's very, very, very sensitive. Some of the things we may hear on the feed, you earlier heard what I call QuakeSpeak, another piece of custom code that I've written. QuakeSpeak looks at the USGS GeoJSON uh, earthquake feed, extracts data from it, compares it to other data that it's seen, and if it's something that I'm interested in, it will actually speak what that earthquake event was. So if you have the stream playing in the background, Every once in a while, you're going to hear a ding, like an airplane ding, when the stewardess goes to talk on the airplane. And then you'll hear a male voice that's going to announce a re earthquake has been recorded by the USGS. It's here. It's this intensity. It happened at this time. If it's a female voice, the female voice indicates that it's a California earthquake. So I have filters that I've wrote into my software that so that it's not constantly talking to us. Like up here at Geysers, you can see there's a huge stack of earthquakes over by the Geysers. That's a, a geothermal operation where they inject groundwater into the ground and it does cause kind of like fracking. It causes fractures in the earth and those fractures are measured as earthquakes. But if it was talking these little zero point something earthquakes all day long, it would drive us all crazy. So I've set some filters. So from the seismograph location, in order for me to announce anything, any, any magnitude earthquake, it has to be within 150, meter, uh, 150 miles of my sensor. If it's outside of 150 miles, it has to breach a magnitude 3.0 in order for the voice to announce it. And if it's outside of California or Nevada, then it has to breach a magnitude 4. And something else you'll hear is instead of the pretty little ding in front, occasionally you'll hear a two-toned alert tone. Beetle, beetle, beetle. That two-toned alert tone is telling us that a magnitude 5.9 or greater earthquake has happened somewhere in the world. And then, of course, the voice will come on and tell us what that earthquake was. The other thing you may occasionally hear is a sound that sounds like a doorbell. A ding dong just like a doorbell. What that is, is that is the software that is doing this upper right hand saying that it has detected what it thinks is an event or something that broke the thresholds of the LTA, STA thresholds that I've put into the software to go, this is something I think it is. It's that computer pick trying to figure out, is this something we need to pay attention to? So if you hear the doorbell, that's that piece of software, and that's saying that that piece of software thinks it saw an event, 
And that also tells us that it is packing that event up and it is sending that event over to our Twitter channel. And so the Twitter feed gets real time input from that program. You'll see the same spectrogram and seismograph that'll get put in the picture and posted onto the Twitter feed. So if you subscribe to the Twitter feed, you'll get sort of real time notifications when my seismograph thinks it sees something. Those pictures will have a link to them. It'll take you right straight into the seismograph feed. Kind of a, an easy way if you're not watching, you get a Twitter notice. Oh, look, it thinks it saw something. It kind of looks like an earthquake because I see that low frequency line here and I see big, highly spaced out waves instead of these tight little squashed together peaks that you're seeing. Um, and that might be like, I'm going to click on the, the live feed link so I can go right over and take a look and see what the seismograph is saying live in real time. So something else to keep in mind. So from here, let's go look at some real earthquake events. So you can see what things look like when there's an actual earthquake happening instead of just the daily dull traffic of Tracy, California. So let's take a look at a recent earthquake that was a magnitude 3.8 in Concord, California. So notice that uh, on the Raspberry Shake map that everything in the Bay Area is greens and yellows. There's a purple in there, but that's just somebody that's there. So our event's about to kick off. Also notice the shake meter's running about 200. There we go. So our P wave has arrived and our S wave has arrived. Notice how on the spectrograph, the bright lines down on the very bottom and the spread out waves on the seismograph up here at the top. Mind you, this is the same data as this. This, this is unscaled, or this is scaled, and this is unscaled. So our P wave arrives right about here. This is our S wave coming in. Now look at the seismographs in the San Francisco Bay Area. You can see they're all very red, purple, angry. So we know that epicenter was somewhere in the California Bay Area around San Francisco. Los Angeles hasn't felt anything yet. Now it takes about a minute for seismic waves to reach from the Bay Area to Los Angeles. Same thing from Los Angeles to the Bay Area. You can see the shake meter starting to fade out now. So the coda is going on. The waves are getting smaller. You can still see that bright yellow line in our spectrograph, but it's starting to fade out. So about now those waves should be getting down to about here and we should start to be seeing the Los Angeles area start to change color here shortly. Now, mind you, those waves are traveling a long way, so those spectrographs in Los Angeles aren't going to go into the big deep purples and reds. They're probably going to be oranges and, and reds, sort of like they are now. The Bay Area seismographs, now that the coat is starting to wear down, should start going back to normal color shortly. We should also hear quake speak kick in here momentarily and tell us what the earthquake was and also see the USGS report on the lower left-hand map and in the last eights event chart in the upper left-hand side.
So the event has appeared on the lower left-hand map as a 3.8. We should see it appear in the upper left. There it goes, 3.8 in Concord. And Quake Speak should kick in momentarily. A reviewed magnitude 3.8 earthquake at a depth of 7 kilometers has occurred, located 2 kilometers west-northwest of Concord, California, which is 38 miles west-northwest of Tracy, California, was recorded by the USGS at 19 hours 18 minutes and 10 seconds UTC. First possible wave arrival is calculated to be here at 19 hours 18 minutes and 22 seconds UTC. And there was Quake Speak telling us what the event was. Sometimes quake speak can be a little slower than the two indications on the left side of the screen. Sometimes a little faster. Uh, just kind of depends on how things are going. And the first anticipated wave arrival would be that first P wave arrival. And she usually calculates it within about five seconds of what the actual arrival time is when she tells us. So that kind of gives us the ability to tell if this is in fact the wave that she is talking about that just arrived. So that's what a medium intensity Bay Area earthquake looks like. Let's go explore a larger earthquake that was a recent 6.0 event on the other side of the foothills uh, that happened in July of 2021. So this time we're going to look at a magnitude 6.0 that happened in July over in Apple Valley, which is on the California Nevada border. It's going to be Right about here were the seven of my RE9A7 ID pointing at my seismograph. My seismograph lives right about where that arrow points to, by the way. But that earthquake occurred somewhere over in here. So let's see what that event looks like. I want you to notice that we have blues and greens on our raspberry shake seismograph indications, both in Northern California and Southern California. Our shake meter is running about 236, 300 uh, normal daytime noise. It is daytime hours when this event happens. This event was actually large enough for us to feel here in Tracy, California. It wasn't uh, rattle the windows size feel, but it was definitely uh, something where you, you notice the S wave coming through. Uh, kind of made you move around in your chair a little bit, uh, just enough to disturb you. So let's take a look at this event and see what we can find out. I'm also going to note that I do not have the sound on for this one, so we won't hear the alarms and we won't hear quake speak, but I just want you to kind of observe what happens. So here comes the S or the P wave, the first arriving wave. Look at shake meter go. Big, big counts. So the P wave's getting here in just a few seconds the S wave is going to arrive. The S wave is that bigger up and down, more violent motion. It's, very, it's much slower moving. So we'll see shake meter show us that. You'll notice that the displays are saturated. They're not going to show us any more data. So this is going to be my best relative indication using shake meter of what the size of the motion is that I'm feeling at the seismograph. You'll also notice right now that there's only one nice purple seismograph on the shake map. Here we are, the big intensity S wave coming in, topping well over 100,000 plus counts. Now we're going to start to see the shake net start to react. You're seeing seismographs now turning purple all over the place. Uh, Northern California up by Reno. Uh, I think ShakeNet was being a little uh, slacky that day. It was kind of herky-jerky with its data. So another interesting thing to note that's going on here is that two earthquakes have appeared on the map in the feed. Both of these were actually, well, I think this one was a foreshock, and this one was actually a false pick on the part of the computer. So in a few minutes, we're going to see 
th this one will actually stay for about 40 minutes it stayed until they reviewed the data and saw that it was in fact a false computer pick but in a few minutes we're going to see big giant rings appear over here that's going to indicate that 6.0 so we're still in the 30,000 count on shake meter we should start seeing California Southern California starting to uh, change colors on this map as those waves start to get down to Southern California pretty soon we're going to see the whole state looking fairly angry as far as the shake map goes up here in the upper left side again notice on the spectrogram how just the bottom is lit up very a very bright yellow color and everything else has now been dimmed out because of the uh, uh, the auto sizing of the display shall we say and then you'll also notice that how big and widely spaced the peaks and troughs and the waves are for an actual earthquake we're seeing one millimeter per second of motion so that's magnitudes greater than that human hair shaking up and down that we saw this is actually feelable motion So now you can see that Los Angeles is starting to turn reds and purples because the S wave has finally arrived in Los Angeles and now they're starting to feel the shaking from this magnitude 6.0 earthquake. Another interesting indication that we have in here is the total counts. That would be from this graph. Uh, this is the total counts. A count can be equated with some math into actual movement size, but the larger this number, the bigger the movement of the sensor. And this is the peak that it's seen. So our peak is pretty darn high. That's over 1 million counts that we're seeing at this point. Earlier on, I had mentioned that if you see this graph where you're seeing the wave go from the very top to the very bottom, that that was a very sizable earthquake. And this is a really good example of that. We absolutely saturated this scale uh, at over 100,000. And obviously with our counts being this high, that's way more than that 100,000 that this was set to that day. And now you can see our big earthquake has appeared on the lower left-hand map, so the USGS has reported that. And that is a magnitude 6.0 earthquake and what it looks like when it appears there. It has not populated on the last date's events list and it has not populated on the last events list. That should come momentarily that these two will update. You can see the code is starting to wear off. We're still in the thousands on the shake meter. Things are starting to calm down as far as the colors of our seismographs go both in Northern California and Southern California but this is still enough of a count that we're still not getting back into our normal yellows and blues and greens quite yet. Ah, there we go. 6.2, Smith Valley, Nevada. So USGS has done its initial report. Over the period of time, this 4.8 disappeared, and this scaled up and down a few times, and they finally settled on, I believe it was a magnitude 6.0 for this event that occurred at just under 10 kilometers deep. So that's what a big earthquake looks like. Again, you can still see the coda going on, that bright yellow line way down on the bottom of the spectrogram and you can still see the waves moving, the wiggles on the seismograph as this scales. And now we're scaling down. So now we're back down to 100 micrometers, which means that full scale is about the width of a human hair. So that shaking has settled down pretty immensely. 
I think that's going to do it for now. I hope you all enjoyed our little overview of the seismograph and what things look like. And uh, as I come up with new things or decide I have more information that I'd like to, to give to you to help you understand this, or if you have questions, reach out, and uh, we'll see what we can do for you. In the meanwhile, from Tracy Seismograph, hope you all have a great day.